should have introduced ourselves as the triple A batteries. Hey, hey, Alidar, that's that's kind of rude. Um, you know, I'm sure many of you guys have felt embarrassed about saying something that nobody else laughed at, or you regretted not saying something that you wanted to say. Well, let's hear what our next speaker has to say about that. She is not only our current PAC representative for ASU, but she is also a phenomenal graphic designer, including making the graphic for this event and a photographer as well. She's a second year major in business administration and design from Hawaii. She will be talking about the construct of being cool and how being cringe is actually being cool. Let's welcome Aaron. and decide that you're one of the weird ones and too much to talk to thing that they tend to do. 
And don't get me wrong, I'll be the first to say that I've definitely done that to people too. Bitches be bitches, man. But <laughs> maybe the best way to inform my argument would be to first dissect the construct of cool. If you break it down into its core elements, I'd say that the construct of cool is largely derived from personal style, sociability, hobbies or specialized interests, life experience, confidence, and authenticity. If I were to refer to someone as cool, those would probably be my baseline markers for defining that. The more I think about it, the less I'm inclined to want to call someone cool, though. It's a bit of a cop-out term, don't you think? I'm a firm believer in giving people their flowers. If something that they do or says resonates with me, I want to credit the positive impact they've had in my life. But to call someone cool can almost imply a sense of championing the other person over oneself. Just think about it. If someone were to come up to you and say, wow, you're so cool, what kind of response would you say to them? Do you even know why they're telling you you're cool? By accepting their compliment without saying anything back, are you implying that they're also not cool? It almost denotes a sense of social distancing between the person being called cool and the person calling them such. In addition to these implications, it's such a terribly non-specific and vague word. If I were to use cool in a compliment, I typically include the aspect of themselves that I find cool. Like, wow, you have such cool style, or I think it's cool how passionate you are about hydrothermal vents and unicorn <laughs> sessions or something. But this is all besides the point. The larger problem with calling someone cool is that there's this simultaneous twisted concept of cool that our current day culture seems to push. I asked some of my friends if they also noticed this double meaning with cool, and this is what my friend Maddie had to say. Cool does have this sort of double meaning, since there's one definition that you as a person form, and then this other definition that paints a picture of some jackass wearing sunglasses flocked by a harem of ovulating teenagers. See? <laughs> Jackass. And a lot of media our culture likes to push at us, one way or another, is this jackass version of cool. And now, don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to get all political here, like, fuck capitalism, consumerism is to blame. But at the same time, like, low-key fuck capitalism, <laughs> it definitely contributes to this culture of buying into trends, doing things for clout, and generally turning to external and material sources for validation and happiness. But I'll stop with my capitalism right there. If you let me keep going, I would really be embracing my no-filter, jaded, old person persona. So, in part due to these C words, I think a lot of people end up with very conflicted messaging, at the very least on a subliminal level. If we're thinking about a more social construct of cool, I think there's a sense of cool deriving from perceived indifference and being naturally good at something. I think all of us naturally want to be good at things, right? Like, who wants to work really hard to get what they have? Maybe it's biologically valuable to surround yourself with people who are naturally good at things compared to those who take more time to learn something. Now, I didn't realize this topic was going to delve into so many different sectors, so let's bring it back in. So we have the two C words and their contributions to material wants and social constructs that emphasize minimal effort to get results. And that can be translated as wanting to be perceived as good at everything you do, being naturally charismatic, not having to try too hard to fit in or get other people's attention. And lastly, this good old Hollywood. With the media's perception of cool, personal style is only part of the puzzle. When you think about media portrayal of cool people, what do you think of? A hot, charismatic Ryan Gosling who gets all the women? A hard-working and sweet turned workaholic ladder climber Anne Hathaway? Or maybe it's a hot and refreshingly exciting Kate Winslet. Did I really say hot that many times? Um, okay. Um, but whatever, she does whatever the hell she wants and will sweep you into her world of adventure. Maybe you don't necessarily connect to these aspects of these fictional characters, but Hollywood still knows just how to target those dopamine, dopamine centers, or at least mine. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, then I'll provide you with the briefest of brief summaries of Crazy Stupid Love, Devil Wears Prada, and Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. So basically, Ryan Gosling is a ladies man who has no intention of dating women. He just picks up women at the bar, takes them home, keeps it as impersonal as it gets, until he meets Emma Stone and falls in love with her quirky ass. Honestly, maybe she makes more sense as the cool person case study. She's like a hot, innocent, doe-eyed girl with a great, albeit naive, personality who's dating a total dork and doesn't realize she can pull way more than she is with her dweeb of a boyfriend. But the part of this story that really gets to you is the fact that a dorky, yet cute, confident girl could pull this mad whore and turn him into an honest and emotionally vulnerable man. Isn't that what every I can fix him girly wants? I mean, maybe, I don't know. I probably shouldn't speak for other people. But I think you kind of get the gist. 
But this is just my tribute to fuck Hollywood too. I don't really want to explain Devil Wears Prada and Eternal Sunshine anymore, so either watch them or suck it up. Uh, but essentially, Hollywood seems to reinforce cool person archetypes like Mad Pixie Dream Girls, Bad Boys, and of course, just hot people. I have like this obsession with hot people. <laughs> um, yeah, so basically, this dynamic between Ryan Gosling and Emma Stone in, in Crazy Stupid Love perfectly depicts the clash of these two schools of cool thought. Genuine, excitable, unbridled authenticity compared to artificial, premeditated, learned confidence. And I hope you guys are all still with me right now. But I just thought it was really funny that like, when I was writing the outline for this, I, like, I don't know, I made it sound a lot more scientific and matter of fact than it really was. Um, I just really like my big words. And I watched Crazy Stupid Love like two weeks ago, which explains why I'm nerding out about whatever the hell the Gosling Stone dynamic is. Um, but now that I've done sufficient shitting on the constructs of society that have made the concept of cool a strange phenomenon to, to exist in our world, I think it's time for some action polls. So I figured it'd probably be good to have you guys take away something from all my geriatric ramblings. First off, I've been intensively turning over this concept of cool in my mind for a while now, and I can say that it genuinely hasn't stopped pestering me whenever I hear the word cool. My first word to the wise would be, do your best to remove the word cool from your vocabulary when describing other people, or yourself, if you're narcissistic like me. <laughs> but even if you mean it with the best intentions, I think it's inherently an alienating word. Subliminally, you are implying a discrepancy between you and the other person. If you admire something specific about that person, I think it's more beneficial for both of you to get more elaborate with your compliments. Also, it's just more fun that way. Um, for example, Earlier, I like noticed the way Augie like carried himself as an MC, and I just thought it was very admirable and inspiring because he just seemed like such a natural at it. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this leads me to my next point. Stop making excuses for yourself or others. If you want to do something, just do it, bro. I don't know what compelled me to give this talk because I'm shitting myself right now, and my hands are 100% way sweatier than I want any of you to know. <laughs> but I didn't plan that compliment ahead of time. That one came straight off the dome. But why am I doing all these things that I'm doing right now? Because life's too short, bro. Why wait on chance and circumstance when you could just grab life by the balls and go for it? Shoot your shot. Make an idiot out of yourself in public. Do things simply to make yourself laugh. Learn from others. Be inspired by others. Be the change, bro. <laughs> to close my arguments, I'm going to leave you all with little wisdom nuggets from two of the people who I've learned so much from. Two of my closest friends, actually. My best friend from home and my mom. This is Emma. Everyone say hi, Emma. Hi, Emma. Thank you. Um, Emma once told me that the only person you should be trying to make laugh is yourself. Evidently, Emma is one of the funniest people you will ever meet. In a room full of however, however many there are of you, this is what I kept in mind while I was working on my talk. At the end of the day, the only person you can control the happiness of is yourself. Might as well raise yourself up if you're going to be the one going home with yourself, you know? <laughs> Unless you're in a relationship. Good for you. <laughs> <laughs> your friends. But, yeah, the amount of times I've said things with an em emphasis on making others laugh more than myself, it instantly started to breed a sense of fraud and insecurity in my mind. I'm going to laugh at what I'm going to laugh at, and you're going to laugh at what you're going to laugh at. End of story. This is Nancy Kelly. I call her my mom, but you guys probably shouldn't call her that because she's not yours. Everyone say hi, Auntie Kelly. Hi, Auntie Kelly. My mom gives me some of the best advice ever. I'm blessed to have a mom that I can talk to and tell everything to. This is also my mini PSA to show your parents more love. If you're out here giving your flowers to your friends and the people you think are cute, your parents must be getting dump trucks full of flowers. I digress. My mom once said to me, it's okay to be a tryhard. Life is more interesting when you don't settle for what is familiar. The people that make fun of those who try hard are the ones who settle for what is safe, and they will live with regret. And while we're not necessarily talking about the act of trying hard, there is a great deal of effort that goes into being true to yourself. Apparently being true to myself means being weird and off-putting. I tend to say a lot of whatever's on my mind and live to regret the things that I say after the fact because nobody got it. Also, I'm just generally bad at filtering my thoughts. Apologies to those that I unintentionally offended with my silly little observations. Even if you aren't, I'm definitely still thinking about it. Aside from that, those that would rather stay in the comforts of social acceptability, living untrue to themselves, will be the ones to truly live with regret. 
Coming from someone who has always been a tryhard over a true achiever in all aspects of life, this is the biggest thing that I believe is actually worth trying hard or not looking cool for. Learn to embrace yourself. Even if you're cringe, at least you're free. Hopefully none of you, none of what I'm saying is new information to you. We all know social media fucking sucks. We all know that Hollywood perpetuates impossible standards. But I hope this serves as a reminder of how much fun life can be when you let it be. The only person who's stopping you from dancing in the rain and whooping with glee is you. Feel your emotions. They're there for a reason. Even the shitty ones have a purpose. If you're spending most of your days feeling shitty, there's probably something else you could do to you could do with your time. Inspire, be inspired by what resonates with you and what doesn't. Take action in your life. We spend too much of our day numb on autopilot. I think life is a series of repeated, repeatedly waking up to the infinite possibilities of the world and choosing to do what you want, to do what you want, rather than just letting life happen to you. I promise you, it's much more fun this way. Okay, before I wrap it up, I have a homework assignment for you all. Um, so. You should have a piece of paper if you're sitting at a chair with a program. Um, if you don't have a pen on you, that's fine. Feel free to take a photo of one of these screens that are projecting said homework. And um, yeah, so basically what I'd like you to do is take this piece of paper and write one thing that you want to do, but always make excuses to not get it done. Remind yourself why it's important to you and what you'll get out of completing it. And then secondly, I want you to write a deadline about when you're gonna get it done by. Lastly, I want you all to write the name of a person who inspires you. That can be interpreted however you want, but make a point to reach out to them this week and tell them that you appreciate what you appreciate about them. It'd also be a great time to practice those more specific compliments that don't use the word cool. And now, for something I never thought I'd get to say, thank you for coming to my TED Talk. <laughs>